My name is Laura Thielander, and I serve as a seminary pastor at Luther Seminary. The, I grew up uh, with my pastor becoming my next door neighbor when I was in third or fourth grade. So I think that was my exposure, but um, it was a male pastor. And, um, and it was really during that time, as I was in confirmation, that I, I said to him, oh, I'm going to be a pastorette, I said to him in eighth grade. And I really have no idea, but I just think I was trying to just irritate him, you know, and just be um, a little bit feisty. But I didn't really um, have any models, um, both within my family's pastors or women pastors, but, um, you know, did, as I said, we, they were our neighbors and, and became family friends over the years. Um, in many ways would, would have been nurtured in my home congregation, um, where just a sense of, of belonging, um, given opportunities to lead and to serve, uh, I think that kind of created the, the soil um, that then really when I went off to college, I found, I went to St. Old College and there found this intersection where my life of faith and a life of service and just um, a life of intellectual curiosity and growth came together. Um, and I would say even in college, I, I didn't really think necessarily ministry as being a pastor, um, but it, in many ways, was just kind of building a sense of, of who I am and, and who I'm called to be in the world. Um, it was really through, I, I thought I would go on and do further graduate work in history, and um, my first year out of college, I was in Lutheran Volunteer Corps. And I was working at Dorothy Day Center in downtown St. Paul among uh, folks that are homeless and low income. Um, and and I, that year, um, as I was thinking about applying to graduate school for the following year, something just didn't seem right in the sense that if I was going to enjoy the opportunities and privileges of further education, um, I really felt this call, this pull that it needed to go to kind of building up others um, in a broader sense and not just um, within a, I don't know, higher educational sense. So I would say that was really the first um, clear conviction of, uh, of thinking about my education, my own growth, going into like service for others. And then it was a year later that uh, I started seminary. I grew up in uh, northeast Nebraska, a town called Norfolk, where very much shaped by um, a Missouri Synod ethos, very German Lutheran. So, um, in many ways, I think as in my, when I said I was um, talked about being a pastorette as um, as a young girl, I think it was more this, this defiance is that I couldn't be limited that um, as a girl, and I think in many ways that was shaped by being a trumpet player. That, I think that was probably more significant in my sense of going into ministry because there weren't a lot of girl trumpet players. And um, I always felt, felt like if I succeeded and did better than, than boys on the trumpet, that there was this tension there. And I, I just remember feeling, um, yeah, that that was really a challenge. I mean, sometimes I feel like preparing me for ministry as a woman was being a trumpet player when that wasn't... Um, kind of the norm for girls. In so many ways, I think my kind of approach um, uh, and experiences were shaped by that. Um, my involvement in church was very much through music and felt, you know, was given opportunities to, to play and to be really active and, and to be in leadership roles through that. So that was really important. I think also, building a sense of, of confidence when you're doing performing, um, and that's, um, you know, learning how to manage anxiety and things like that, that's been helpful to think about the public role of ministry. Um, for, for the time at St. Olaf, uh, the music was really important because I think it was really infused with a deeper understanding of faith. And so for me, uh, my own life of faith, I think really deepened as I saw how music and faith are so intertwined. Um, I think, I, I mean, this is, this is now moving ahead into my first call. Um, I was 
the first woman pastor in a congregation in Northeast Minnesota. It was an associate pastor position. And the senior pastor, um, he was just, as I look back, he was really great and intentional about preparing the congregation to welcome me as a full, equal partner in ministry. And, you know, he had been in ministry for over 20 years, had been at this congregation for you know, 15, 16 years. And the way in which he welcomed me as an equal was so important. Um, and I remember he had written a, a newsletter article um, on Mary and when she, in some sense, received the call. And then he, he used that story as a way of kind of preparing the congregation for my coming the next month. Um, and just really appreciated the way in which he, um, as I said, treated me and viewed me and spoke of me as an equal in ministry. And I think that was really significant in giving me the confidence as well as the opportunity to, to lead in ministry from the very beginning. You know, certainly you, you, encounter, you encounter people that, um, I mean, even in my first call, I knew there were some people that voted no because, as I said, I was the first woman um, pastor in that congregation. And so there was just, I think, suspicions or assumptions, and, um, and I knew a little bit of that. And I think um, I didn't have any egregious confrontation, but knowing that I was also kind of being on trial or evaluated, and not to let that um, dictate my or to kind of overwhelm my sense of, of who I was and who I was called to be. Um, and to some sense rely, I guess, on my own um, merits and knowing that I was called and I was qualified for that um, and not to be defensive or reactive about that. Um, I think in many ways I, I've found, um, after that first call I went on to do PhD work in systematic theology, I would say in many ways doing graduate work, particularly in theology, that there were more explicit kind of barriers. Um, in systematic theology, I said I often kind of felt back when I was in fifth or sixth grade playing trumpet, like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here, you know, and it felt very much, you know, kind of like more of an old boys network. And so just even, you know, the dynamics, um, it seemed a very kind of male dominated field and male dominated conversation. And, I know with some of my female colleagues in the program, we often felt as though that we didn't have the same sort of opportunities for support and mentorship um, that our male colleagues did. And so in many ways, I think the academic world, particularly in, in, in theology, what I experienced, there, was, there were more just obvious kind of gender biases and preferences and privileges, um, more so than I had seen in seminary. You know, I'm also the first woman in this position, and I think um, I, I probably won't go into any specifics, but I you know, would say that I've been mindful at times of seeing myself um, as someone who's been younger than my predecessors and also the first female. And sometimes things happen where I wonder um, if this would have happened to my predecessor. And so um, I make a mental note of that and move on, but certainly that's crossed my mind. Well, I think for me, it comes back to the work of the Holy Spirit. And if we believe and confess that it's the Holy Spirit who gives us gifts and is at work in our lives and is calling us to various forms of ministry, then who are we to say that the Holy Spirit is not calling uh, women? And so for me, it's not, um, it's not so much that women have a right to be ordained, because I don't know if men necessarily have a right to be ordained, but it's a matter, matter of individuals and communities discerning and recognizing that women and men have been gifted and called by the Holy Spirit to these roles of leadership in the church. And who am I or who are we to, to work against or stand against the Holy Spirit? And so that's my conviction that... Um, that it's not a matter of finding proof text, but it's more about recognizing the work and the freedom of God's spirit to call who God wants to call. I, 
and this going, this is setting it up a little bit. Going back, my first call was to a congregation named Hope, and I and in many years, many ways, my experience in that congregation was learning what what the Christian hope is um, that came in the midst of a really horrific tragedy in that community. And so, um, as I as we uh, moved through that time, really this kind of theme emerged of of hope, the Christian hope that we have, and a God who's stronger than death, who is more powerful than evil. Um, years after finishing it, as I was finishing up my PhD, I, I took another call at a congregation named Grace, and it was a uh, it was a it was a challenging context with a congregation who had had gone through a lot of conflict, a lot of different pastors, and um, and I. And in many ways, I, as I struggled and worked through that call, I knew somehow that I was ha trying to learn about, learning about grace in that experience. Um, and I'm still unpacking that. I, I served there for five years. And for many ways, I think um, part of it is this grace is the sense of accepting, an acceptance of who we are. Um, and I think um, in this congregation, I learned both to accept the congregation as they were and to love them with all of their quirks and um, peculiarities and gifts. And I think at a deep level, they really did embody grace. And that's all this kind of, um, you know, I, I think about the story of um, a woman who uh, was African American and she was marrying a, a man who had been a member of this church and he was white, and her family really wasn't supportive. And she was um, had just started attending the church when I arrived. And she described the the matriarch in that congregation, Mother Mary, um, welcoming her from the get go, and then walking with her, being her family at at their wedding. And in spite of you know this deep conflicted history, there was this the sense of of welcome and acceptance. Of and of me, who was, you know, not didn't fit their typical mold of pastor, and for this congregation that maybe didn't fit my idea of what a congregation should be, but I think we, we grew to love each other and to accept each other and the gifts that each of us brought, um, and to um, be amused by our peculiarities. And so I think there's a sense for me, grace was, I, I learned more about grace in the sense of learning to kind of accept what is and to know that. In that sense, grace, God's grace is sufficient um, and to um, not fight things so much, um, not try to change people or congregations, but to receive what is, to live with that and to love the people that are part of that. So legacies, I think, are hard to in some sense create. In some sense, it's more about um, living into who you are and, and just hoping and trusting that seeds you plant will grow. So my, my hope is that um, that in ministry here and, and anywhere else that um, tending to matters of um, growing in our understanding of faith and enjoying the full abundance of life that that faith gives us and grants us that um, that I would I hope to be a mentor and supporter and encourager uh, in that for our leaders, that um, it's not just about the skills that they bring, but that it's a deep love for God that continues to grow in their lives that they share with others.